Good day, everybody. This is Father Andre Metrejean from Our Lady of Lords, and we're having another digital mission with a new podcast today. And we're going to talk about a very special topic Ember Days. We're going to get into that with a special guest today. So, today we have with us in the studio Tim Trosclair. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Tim is a, a tutor at the St. John the Cross Academy based out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Tell us a little bit about the St. John of the Cross Academy. Sure. Well, we started it uh, about three years ago, in 2015. We're on our third year right now. Uh, it's a small classical Catholic school. Uh, started to really help parents take on the uh, precept of the church that they be the primary educators of their children. So we work closely with the students. We have a one-on-one -on -one tutorial set up between us and the students. Uh, and we're not allowed, you know, more than eight students per teacher to make sure that the... Yeah, I think a lot of teachers would be very jealous of that. Yes. <laughs> of that ratio. Yes, they are. Classical. <laughs> what is a classical Catholic education? What does that even mean? Well, <clears throat> the, the classical part is based on the historical definition which includes um, teaching pupils in the Western tradition using primarily the Latin and Greek languages and the literature of the West from uh, Homer all the way to our modern day. Uh, so um, this is a popular model for, for many, really many centuries that mm -hmm. the kind of uh, Catholics were pioneers in America for having an expansive school system. The Catholic school system in America mm -hmm. was really revolutionary in many right. ways. And a lot of these schools originally kind of had somewhat of a classical model. Right, um, right. Tell us a little about the, the it's kind of based off the Jesuits and, and the Trivium. Mm -hmm. is that, is that, the Trivium. Tell, tell us a little mm -hmm. about that. So the, the Jesuits didn't allow for more than two uh, consecutive days of schooling uh, at a time. <laughs> Kids <laughs> would like that. They love it. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, every Monday and Tuesday we have academic instruction and then Wednesdays we have a practicum where the pupils are learning how to put on different practical skills like gardening, uh, how to bake, how to cook, how to change a tire, change the oil, um, you know, carpentry, anything like that. that we can. That, and, and we have the parents come and they bring their skills to the school. I mean, ideally they come and, and they uh, offer their skills to the pupils so that they can learn from them as well. And then Thursday and Friday we're back to academic instruction. That's great. It kind of forms a little community. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. And you know we're based out of Lafayette right now? We're based out of Lafayette. We have some property in Sunset. Uh, we're trying to raise some money to build a building out there so that we can really start to implement the Benedictine style of uh, education we want to implement, which is uh, based on you know, ora et labora, prayer and work. Right now, we, we're able to pray the uh, hours of prime, ter, sext, and non, which are the so traditional what, Benedictine hours of so prayer. What are the hours? Can you explain the hours? Sure. Prayer, yeah. So the, the, uh, the hours include um, matins, louds, prime, ter, sext, non, vespers, and compline. Uh, for the Benedictine monks, which is based on, you know, prime is from the Latin for first. So the first hour of the day is sunrise, 6 a.m. Terse is three hours later at 9 a.m., sex to noon, and so on. And during on. this time, you're praying a lot of the Psalms from the Old Testament. That's right. And a lot of uh, mm -hmm. ancient readings from the church fathers. And, mm -hmm. and, um, right, praying just like the uh, traditional Benedictines would have prayed. And you know, the Psalms, like our Lord prayed. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, today we're going to talk about ember days mm -hmm. you, you might not have heard of this phrase but it's an ancient tradition really some people say it goes back all the way to the apostles yeah. and um so ember days involves a lenten practice fasting so before we get into the ember days and when they are and, and how they involve fasting i think it'd be good if we had a conversation just about fasting itself mm -hmm. uh, i know saint thomas he's very clear that fasting is actually part of the human heart is part of natural law that God has programmed into our heart a desire to abstain from food out of love of God. You mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. sure. St. Thomas says, um, really, ultimately, fasting is done to undo the effects of the fall, which uh, took our integrated soul, which had all the faculties in a proper order with the intellect at the top, always seeing God, the will, always strong enough to choose him, 
and the passions and the emotions and the lower faculties following suit. Uh, the, in fact, Paradiso Man Before the Fall uh, had total control over his body and creation, right? So uh, it's more likely that he told himself when he was hungry rather than his stomach telling him when to eat. Uh, that he had that kind of control, that the intellect and the will had that kind of authority over the lower faculties. But then when we fell by turning the mind away from God, by freely choosing to take the intellect and turn it away from God into self, uh, then those got flipped upside down. And the passions and emotions now cloud the intellect. We can't see God clearly. And the will can only choose what the mind can see. And so now the will is weak. And when we fast, St. Thomas says we, we undo that. We put the, the higher faculties back at the top and the lower faculties back at the bottom where they belong. Yeah, and, and it's also it involves a, a, an act of love, an act of worship. I was going to say it, sh it shouldn't be considered just a matter of uh, self-mastery or uh, making a, a better you now. Uh, it should be a matter of self-mastery so that you can give that self to God more, more freely. And we see fasting a lot, actually, in, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. We see it again uh, with the Jewish traditions. If we look in the, in the Talmud and in other Jewish mm -hmm. books, we see it was very important for the Jewish, the Jewish people of the Old mm -hmm. Testament. And in the New Testament, Christ makes it very clear that we are called to fast in the Sermon on the Mount mm -hmm. and in some of the instructions to the apostles. And really early documents uh, in the church, uh, the Didache. Let's talk about the Didache a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the Didache is one of the earliest documents that we have from the early Christians. And it could potentially predate some of even the scriptures, right. depending on the date that we do. Some people say it's around maybe 75 to 95 AD. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how the early Christians fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Because mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to be like the neighboring pagans who fast, uh, was it Tuesdays and, and Sunday, Thursdays? Thursdays. Yeah. And St. Jerome talks about that. Uh, the, Jew, the Jews fasted on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And of course, you had the, the problem of Judaizing, right? Where, where people thought you could follow the old law. The mosaic, the law. mosaic law, kosher food, right, right, and uh, follow Christ as well as if he didn't fulfill the law already. So Saint Jerome says we moved it to Wednesdays, Fridays, and then Saturdays as well. Uh, and it's interesting that you know you see fasting in almost every culture that that exists, right? Even mm -hmm. even religions today that are are not in accord with truth, like Islam or or other movements. You see, fasting is an integral mm -hmm. part of their religious experience, mm -hmm. because fasting is programmed into our hearts mm -hmm. that God has given to us. So even though their religion is mixed with errors and, and, and uh, false notions, uh, you see that there's a seed of truth there mm -hmm. that desire to offer sacrifice. Yeah, and I think people people know that it it makes them psychologically healthy. That it's a natural virtue. Fasting mm -hmm. is a natural virtue. It's a supernatural virtue when we intend it for a supernatural end, the love of God. But it's also a natural virtue that just perfects the nature of your being. And you see that in, in uh, pagan literature as well, like you said. It's all throughout Homer and the great epics of, of uh, antiquity. So the church throughout the centuries has incorporated the desire of Christ to fast in different regulations, which have changed. Mm -hmm. So for example, right now, in the East, Eastern Catholics have a totally different set of rules and regulations to fast than we do in the West. There's, there's a lot of abstaining from uh, even eggs, and dairy mm -hmm. products in certain right. days. They're basically vegans <laughs> yeah. for a lot of Lent. Uh, I'm glad I'm Western, you know, right. sometimes. But uh, we can learn a lot from them. But throughout the centuries, there have been different movements of the church, different regulations. But one kind of consistent uh, practice throughout the history of Christianity has been these ember days. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the history of ember days. Yeah. So Pope Leo the Great talks about them extensively. And, and he's he, around the 7th century? 5th uh, fifth, fifth century. 5th century. Fifth century Pope, uh, Pope St. Leo the Great. And he says that this goes back to the apostles as well, right? So, I mean, it's not historical fact, but it is based on tradition, which should be enough for a Catholic to accept that this goes back to the apostles. Uh, St. Isidore of Seville also speaks about it going back to the apostles as well. And then you have it throughout the church. I think St. Charles Borromeo brought it to Milan and St. Uh, Gregory, not Gregory, to a Martin de Tours brought it to France, or he at least talks about it extensively in France. But uh, 
in the 11th century, you have Pope Gregory the Seventh, Pope Saint Gregory the Seventh, making it a law of the church for everyone to fast the Ember Days, um, and and from there, from the 11th century, it lasts all the way up until uh, the until around 1969 when we did away with the Ember Days. Then, um, but and they're still encouraged. They're still encouraged. Yeah, and yeah. Still... And if you want to be deeper in line with the tradition of your faith, it would be a, a great idea to start putting on the fasting and the prayers that come with the, the Ember Days. So they also, it's very interesting, is that they have a liturgical element to them. Mm-hmm. The readings for the day at Mass are, are usually multiplied, especially in Saturdays of Ember Days. I think they usually have like what, six, seven, seven, seven readings. readings, I believe. Uh, so, uh, and there's different special collects and prayers mm-hmm. for these Ember Days. So talk a little about the liturgical element of Ember Days. Well, um, I've only been practicing the Ember Days as a matter of fasting and and doing some of the readings. I'm not that familiar with the liturgical element because it's fallen out of practice. So uh, maybe maybe we can start having some liturgical We're Ember have Days. We're going to bring back the Ember Days. Yes, well, or, or we could just start going to your Ember Day Masses. <laughs> So ember, let's talk about the, even the word ember. Yeah. When you think of ember, you think of, I think of ashes. Right. I think of coals left behind. Right. Uh, is, there Which a, is, is there a connection There is a that? connection, but I've, I've looked up uh, the etymology for the word ember, and there are so many um, opinions on this, I can't figure out where it came from. But it some say it loosely comes from quatuor tempora, which means the four seasons or the four times, mm. right? And and because the Ember Days, I don't think we said this, but the Ember Days happen four times a year. Four times. And they're based on the four seasons of the so year. So it's very interesting, for the in the Old Testament, for, for the, the people of God in the Old Testament, numbers were very significant. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of continued in Christianity. Mm-hmm. So really, it's significant that there are 12 Ember Days mm-hmm. throughout the year. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> ap- uh, after the apostles, after the foundation of the church, and so there are four sets of ember days, and there are three with that, pieces. With that idea, um, the church fathers often use the numbers 10 and 4 to combine the Ten Commandments with the multiplying that by 4 with the 40 days of fasting mm. that Christ did and, mm. the, and the 40 days and nights of, uh, of the flood. And, um, and it's fitting because right, Christ says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the best ways to be sure your will is strong enough to keep his commandments is to practice the four seasons of fasting with mm-hmm. the Ember Days, mm-hmm. which would bring you back in line with the Ten Commandments of our Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they happen four times a year. And like I said, it comes. the Ember might come from the word tempera. Some say uh, it's a, you know, just a corruption of the word. Or tempera meaning time. Time, right, or season. Um, or, it, or it means, and, it, and you should just assume that it means Ember, which means a burning away of sin and all the things that are in us that offend God, mm. right? So you, you see how these ember days build upon the natural cycles of the cosmos. Mm-hmm. So God in his providence and his goodness has given all of his children the four seasons, right? Winter, mm-hmm. fall. Well, in Louisiana, we have one. <laughs> right. One big season. But the rest of the world, they have four seasons. And you transition from harvest times to gathering mm-hmm. times, uh, etc., and that these four sets of ember days, which are three days apiece for each set of ember days, mm-hmm. are evenly spread throughout the different seasons of the natural year. Right. But they get uh, caught up in the mm-hmm. supernatural element of the liturgical year. And right. How they're caught up. So which, let's talk about the first ember days. Well, I was going to say that that fits too with the church's teaching that uh, grace perfects nature. Mm. So that the more you are in line with creation and nature. Christ does not suppress who we are. Correct. He elevates who we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the more you are in line with that with that creation, the more you're disposed for His grace to work. work I, think, on. I think it's an important time, important thing to talk about, especially in our modern uh, society today. A lot of Christians fall into this trap that Christ came to forgive my sins, and that's it. Right. right. But mm-hmm. Christ is so much more than just forgive my sins. He elevates my soul, my mm-hmm. heart, my being. To a supernatural degree, right? I that's participate right. in God's inner life, right? And this this um, was scandalous to me as a Protestant, and I would have called this person a heretic if it wasn't Saint Paul saying it. But he says in Colossians one twenty four, "I fill up in my bones what is lacking in Christ on the cross." So his suffering 
is what he fills up in his bones and what is lacking on the cross. Obviously, it's nothing in Christ. It's that we are not on it with him. Mm -hmm. And of course, fasting uh, with with humility and the right intention uh, puts you up there with him, which is what we're called to do. And with the presence of grace in our heart. You know, right, right, right. So the first uh, set of Ember Days begins in the liturgical year with Advent, mm -hmm. right around the Feast of St. Lucy. Right, for in the three weeks into Advent. Often when you see St. Lucy, she's holding a, a platter of eyeballs. eyeballs right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is funny because that, that's fitting since fasting gives you that kind of clarity. To right? see clearly. That's, that's one of the reasons St. Thomas says to fast, and, and really all the saints of the church. One of the reasons is because the, the passions throw up dirt in the eyes of the mind. And so meditation and contemplation almost become impossible. And uh, I was actually talking about this with um, Nick the other day. He was talking about... Uh, Nick is your brother? It, right. He's one of the tutors at St. John the Cross Academy. He was uh, talking about the Desert Fathers. And we were talking about how they said, if, if you don't want to lust or give in to sins of the passion, never eat to your fill. Mm, <laughs> right? Mm, mm. That, don't, that doesn't mean you have to be fasting always like, like the superhumans that were the desert fathers but it does mean that if you practice that negation of the will it's more likely you won't fall into those sins and you, and you clear your mind and, and your mind will be cleared to meditate and and ultimately contemplate which is the end so the first one happens around saint lucy and it's a set it's, it's on a wednesday mm -hmm. on a friday and on a saturday right and and it's on those three days because wednesday commemorates the uh, betrayal of Judas. We call it Spy Wednesday. Spy Wednesday, right. And then Friday, of course, the crucifixion, which every every Friday should be an act of penance. You you should really be abstaining every Friday. and uh, But on, on an ember day, obviously, that's brought to a much greater degree with, with fasting. And then Saturday, of course, is the day our Lord went into uh, hell to, to bring back the keys. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and, you know, interesting about Saturday, it's always been seen by a lot of theologians as a Marian day, mm -hmm. uh, a day of Our Lady, who is the new Sabbath, the new day of rest in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's seen liturgically. The church has, for a long time, celebrated Mary um, on Saturdays. So um, Mary herself, as an obedient uh person of God, an uh, obedient Jew, would have fasted, you know, mm -hmm. and in a certain sense, we're fasting with Our Lady Right. On Saturdays. Yeah. So, okay, that's the first set, which begins with the Advent season, the beginning of the new liturgical year. Right, first Wednesday after St. Lucy. And the next one happens during Lent. And mm -hmm. We're kind of lucky. Right. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> we have one this week, right? That's right. February 21st, February 23rd, and February 24th are another set of Ember Days. Mm -hmm. And this always happens the week after Ash Wednesday. One week after Ash Wednesday, yeah. And it's... Uh, we shouldn't feel lucky because of this, but we do, I think, because of our fallen nature. We no longer fast like we used to, right? I mean, the, the law of the church used to be something like eight ounces a day per food, if you were healthy, uh, throughout all of Lent, right? All 40 days of Lent, um, and of course, not on the Sundays, but the 40 days outside of the Sundays of Lent, you were pretty much fasting every day. Um but with bringing back the ember days, we can at least get back to fasting three more extra days in Lent rather than just the Wednesday and the, and the Good, Friday. Good Friday. Yeah, the Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. So, okay, that's the next season. Another season happens, uh, occurs in, is after kind of the forgotten Feast of the Church, Pentecost. Yeah. Pentecost is really, if you look in, in the history of the church, one of the biggest feast days, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe more important. You could even say than Christmas, mm -hmm. uh, historically. Mm -hmm. And after Pentecost, we have celebrate two big feast day, uh, Corpus Christi and, mm -hmm. and the Tr Trinity Sunday. Mm -hmm. So between that time of Pentecost, when the coming of the Holy Spirit is celebrated and Trinity Sunday, there's another set of Ember Days, a Wednesday, a Friday, a Saturday, mm -hmm. uh, right in the smack middle mm -hmm. of that period. Yeah, and that, that uh, obviously prepares us for trinity sunday where we celebrate and feast the height of our faith right we, we put our minds on what is at the height of all we're trying to do which is to get back to the trinitarian life saint thomas says that it's higher to contemplate the trinity 
but it's better to contemplate the incarnation mm. because from our perspective, from our perspective, right? We would uh, the mystics can contemplate the Trinity perhaps more than the incarnation, but for us, we need to contemplate the incarnation because of our uh, our weak mind. That's why he became man. So and that's that just a fancy way of him. saying thinking about Christ's physical mm-hmm. flesh mm-hmm. His and the movements. Heart, and his actions and his mm-hmm. thoughts and his emotions and his sentiments. Right. This is the beauty of meditation is that we try to imagine with that, that uh, gift of imagination mm-hmm. what Christ was thinking, what he was feeling, right. how he how he loved the Father, how he loved his mother, how he loved uh, his neighbors who were sick and, and in need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and walking through the movements of his historical life, right, which is what Lent is perfect for us because we're doing exactly what he did to the best of our abilities when he went out into the desert. And then next, the fourth final set of Ember Days happens around the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, which Mm -hmm. is September 14th. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the Wednesday after the Feast of the Exaltation. So each of these has a certain, um, in certain way, revolves around a mystery of Christ's life. So Mm -hmm. Advent, obviously we're celebrating his coming to the world and his second coming. During Lent, we're preparing for his death and resurrection, Pentecost. It's Jesus himself who sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And the exaltation of the cross, uh, another reflection upon the mystery and the triumph of how Christ has conquered all Mm -hmm. um, through the mystery of his blood and through the wood of the cross. Right, right. It's interesting that um, St. John of the Cross, patron of our academy, would have his mystical experiences based on the liturgical calendar and not, not on his choice not no right he, right you don't, don't press the button but no it, not but god in, his, in beautiful providence right had he had a lot of the these experiences of god. right he he because he was constantly disposing himself especially in fasting mm-hmm. for saint john of the cross he was constantly disposing himself for god to reveal himself to him in that way uh god would do so and when he did not like you said, not at the beck and call of John of the Cross, but at his great humility, he would reveal himself as the babe, you know, at Christmas, mm. as the crucifixion on Good Friday and things like that, mm. because he was so in tune with creation and the celebration of that creation being raised to a higher level through the liturgical calendar. That, and that brings another another point: uh, the mystical body of Christ. Mm-hmm. I, I can kind of feel it. Maybe I'm I'm being overly sentimental. But on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, when the whole church is fasting, mm-hmm. it's almost as if you can sense uh, the, the spiritual dynamic power mm-hmm. uh, of, of the whole people scattered throughout the whole world uh, offering suffering to God. Yeah. And just think about how we're all united as a Christ body. And, and the more that we offer love to God and sacrifice to God, mm-hmm. the more power there is mm-hmm. uh, grace can flow maybe more freely because we're removing those obstacles and then other people who've never heard of Christ will have a more of a chance of hearing the gospel mm-hmm. because of our little sacrifice. It's a beautiful mm-hmm. thing to think about in Ember Days. If we all sacrifice like this throughout the world, you know, obviously grace transcends time and space and, mm-hmm. and, and things, but that how we're coming together and, and that's really the spiritual force that we have. We don't have, as a church, we're really, we're kind of broke. <laughs> yeah. People think of the Vatican and all these paintings, but the Vatican is not really, you know, we don't have money. We're not good at politics. <laughs> the first apostles, you know, they're, they're a bumbling fishermen, you know. We're, you know, we, we have some intellectual traditions, but we're really not the smartest guys in the world. What do we have? We have the, the power of mm-hmm. Christ running through us. Yeah, um, and, and, and the traditions of the church, which I would I would say we need to get back to that I think we've lost on a on a grand scale. Right? And it's through tradition we kind of forget about it. The tradition is a way of hearing the Word of God. Right. So the Word of God is not contained only in Scripture, right. but it's also contained in, in, in tradition. Right. Well, even and even in um, Vatican II, you see that tradition and sacred scripture are means to revelation and the magisterium the teaching office of the church is a servant to those Mm -hmm. two right in in dei verbum and in the catechism it's very clear that it is a servant to those two and you don't hear much about tradition these days though Mm -hmm. (laughs) something interesting in ember days is that ordinations used to happen used to happen on ember days Mm -hmm, so it's kind of interesting that think of a local community they have a young man it's going to be ordained a priest or a deacon and the whole community is fasting on that Friday mm-hmm. and that, that Wednesday and that Friday and that Saturday while they're fasting, he's ordained a priest. The kind of yeah. the local community is participating in that preparation for the yeah, and it and it showed the priest that his his 
ordination was entering into a life of sorrow first, right? And, and of penance and suffering for his flock like the master did. Uh, we have a lot of images of our Lord resurrected and, you know, winking with his thumbs up. But uh, Isaiah prophesies Christ as the man of sorrow. The suffering servant. Right, the suffering and servant. it's through the suffering then. Right. The glorious resurrection. Right. You, yeah. you can't imagine it unless you've suffered it. But the joy, the true joy that comes on the other side of suffering, uh, rather than the cheap joy that comes when you try to grab at it. You know, it's interesting that in, I think it's synoptics, the, the first three Gospels, mm-hmm. when Jesus talks about his upcoming passion, he talks about it in a sense of birth pangs, mm-hmm. uh, giving birth. Yesterday I went to hospital with one, one of our parishioners. A shout out to the Curals and the new mm-hmm. baby. I saw the new baby, <laughs> uh, a violet yesterday, beautiful baby. And I just thought about when... when uh, when, when that baby is being born, was a lot of pain, it's a lot of mm-hmm. intensity, right? But after that intense pain and love and sacrifice comes this beautiful, beautiful mm-hmm. new life, this new joy. Mm-hmm. Um, any final thoughts about Ember Days that you'd like to share? Uh, just start doing them. <laughs> so you can actually, if you go to a local uh, Catholic bookstore, you can if you find some old calendars, sometimes they have calendars with the old... Um, feast on them. You can actually yeah. find Ember Days listed on the calendar. Yeah, and I would recommend listening to. You can find it on YouTube. The talk by Father Chad Ripiger on the Ember Days. He talks about the Rogation Days as well, which are similar to the Ember Days. But um, he talks about that, and he talks about how the importance of putting on. People don't realize this, but fasting is a virtue. It's a when when you have a virtue, you have a disposition in the soul to do what is good with ease. And, and that's why it takes about, psychologists say it takes about six weeks to develop a habit. When people fasted all of Lent, roughly six weeks, they ended Lent with the virtue of fasting. Mm-hmm. And so putting on the Ember Days is a way to move closer to that actual virtue of being in a disposition of it rather than just dragging your feet and uh, doing it every now and then, you know. With Tim, we thank you for coming on the mm-hmm. podcast today. And we're wishing everyone a holy and happy Lent. Prochadam Sapache and Nomini Christi. Amen. Amen.